Okay, geographers, we're going to get going here with the first in a handful of lectures that will cover the theory behind a lot of this stuff that we're going to be doing in this course. So, you know, for Geography 201 here, map interpretation and GPS, I like to make it a very more hands-on, practical uh, kind of class where you're learning techniques, you're learning how to use equipment and, and stuff like that that'll benefit you in whatever it is you're hoping to get out of this uh, uh, class, what you're planning on doing with your careers and all that. Uh, but honestly, some of this, uh, frankly, boring theory, theoretical stuff is incredibly important. And if you don't understand that, even the basics of some of this stuff, um, you know, it doesn't really matter if you know how to use a GPS receiver or a compass or, or whatever it might be, because you're, you're going to wind up making some mistakes as you go between, you know, say compass and map or GPS and map and, and using GIS and, and all that. So that's why this stuff is important. And with any of it, I mean, today, what I'm going to be getting into, not that crazy. I'm going to be a little more abstract and get a big picture and look at some historical stuff here. Uh, in a bit, but with some of this other stuff, and as we continue to get into some of the nerdier things, don't panic if it doesn't click right away, or if you, like my whole thing, when I started learning this stuff, was I just kind of wondered, how am I ever going to remember all of these different things about, I don't know, coordinate systems, or map projections, or this, or, or that, uh, it eventually it clicks, right? Through a lot of practice, uh, and actually messing around with the stuff. So don't panic if some of this seems really foreign or, or out there. Just just go with it, right? Eventually, you'll eventually it all work. It, it, it trust me. All right, let's get going here. So to start with, I'm gonna read this quote by J. B. Harley, who was this brilliant, uh, what we'd call a critical cartographer, and you'll you'll get to see why here. Let me just read this. Cartography's assumptions are that the objects in the world to be mapped are real and objective, and that they enjoy an existence independent of the cartographer, that their reality can be expressed in mathematical terms, that systematic observation and measurement offer the only route to cartographic truth, and that this truth can be independently verified. That's deep, right? You follow all that? Um, I don't know if you did or, or not. This is yet another reason why I'd rather be in a classroom with you guys than doing this uh, remotely here, because we could be looking at each other and talking about this kind of stuff, but say la vie. Um, so, so think about that. What is Harley saying here with this quote? And if you want to just pause the recording right now and, and think about it, before I, I give it all away and I, I tell you how I think you should think about it, right? Um, but but as I read this thing here, what he what he's saying, like the key stuff I, I highlighted in here. So that, that first part of it, right? It's the idea with cartography, which is the art and science of making maps, right? It's map making, which is what we're going to be we're going to be dealing with the end product. For the most part, but we'll do a little map making of our own in this uh, class here. Um, so the idea with cartography is that we've got these things out in the world that are real, right? Things that are objectively real out there. Um, what do you think about that? Doesn't that kind of sound like, well, well duh. Yeah, of course there's stuff, the stuff I'm mapping out there, of course is real, right? I mean, why else? I'm not mapping pretend things and, and like this this road or this, you know, mountain range or stream or whatever. Yeah, it's real. Come on. Come on, what are you talking about? What's this hippie nonsense? Um, it, but we need to question that. And that's what Harley was doing here, right? And it's not to say if I'm making a map of this local area, these, you know, rocks and trees and stuff like that, that they're not real, that they're holograms or we're all in the matrix or something like that. So that's not what he's getting at here. It's this, this second part, right? And that they enjoy an existence independent of the cartographer, 
right? That's a key component here. What he's getting at, he's saying that everything we're mapping, it's connected to the person doing the mapping, right? That cartographer, whether it's you doing that work or whether it's some map that we're using that was produced by some cartographer, right? So whoever's actually making the map, that person is making decisions, deciding to map this, to map that, to highlight this, to highlight that. And we'll get into some of the, the techniques of that stuff later on. But it's all connected to that individual person, meaning that maps are subjective, right? As opposed to objective, right? They're not reality. They're a cartographer's interpretation of reality. And that might sound like, you know, what, again, what, what, what's the big deal here? But this is, this is very important for a whole host of reasons. If you're going to be using maps, like right off the bat, you always want to remember that a human being produced this map that you're using. And human beings are not perfect, right? They don't, you know, always uh, do things with 100% accuracy. They don't always necessarily make the best decisions and, and so on, right? So we just, we, if, if nothing else, we want to remember, hey, this thing I'm using to record data out in the field or to get from point A to point B or, you know, to do some kind of spatial analysis, all, all the stuff that we're going to be doing from here on out, just always remember the map was made by a human being, right? And so therefore, it's subjective. Right? And the other thing to think about, though, we can take this even deeper and as we get into the second part of this quote here. Um, so it's the idea that things are, you know, mapped are real and objective. Enjoy this existence independent of the cartographer. Cool. That their reality can be expressed in mathematical terms. And it kind of gets into that, that same idea of being real and objective and not being connected to humanity in any way. When we think of math, and we'll think of that a lot when we're looking at coordinate systems and scale and some of these map elements and using maps and all that, we tend to think that math is something that's that's beyond human beings, right? And we, you know, we can get into the origins of numbers and math and, and all that. There's all sorts of philosophy behind that. But it's the idea that quite often if someone, like it's like uh, statistics, right? Somebody presents you with statistics. Uh, the, the, the default reaction usually is to go like, oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, look, look, numbers, right? Rather than somebody just talking about their, you know, feelings or emotions or, or whatever. We see those numbers, we think, yeah, that's, that's legit. Um, but statistics, you can do all sorts of stuff with that stuff. You can mess around with math, uh, with numbers, and, and, you know, manipulate these seemingly, you know, real and objective things, depending on what kind of math you're doing, right? And you, you know, this is, I realize this is veering into kind of conspiratorial discussions right now, right? They're like, oh, these, these map makers are out to get you. Uh, it's not, it's not like there's some, you know, global conspiracy where maps are wrong and manipulating, you know, you sheeple and, and all that. It's not that. Not getting to that necessarily. We, we may talk about some of, there are plenty of, of maps that you find, in, you know, Online, especially, uh, especially around like political events, elections, and things like that, that are just flat out wrong and trying to manipulate people. Um, but it's, that's not always the case, right? But still, we just we want to question what is this person, you know, who made the map? What are they doing? What kind of math are they they using here? What decisions are they making? And we'll we'll see. I'm still making up this course as I go, as I. I usually do. Um, so, so I'll see what I wind up showing you guys and, and all that. But there will be plenty of stuff where as you start to make maps, you realize you can use some seemingly objective mathematical operations and statistical operations within a map to display data in a certain way or to analyze data. But if you're not careful uh, about it, you can display something that for all intents and purposes, is wrong or untrue or whatever, simply because you used an improper mathematical operation, okay? 
for now, just with this stuff, keep in mind that again, all of this map stuff, it should be questioned, right? We should look at it, read it critically and ask questions about who made this map? Why did they make this map? What was the purpose, right? And what we'll see quite often is it's not some, like I said, not some evil trying to lie kind of deal, but sometimes a map was used for a very, or made for a very specific purpose, and we're trying to use it for something that it really wasn't designed for, and so we assume it's correct, because, you know, come on, it's a map, and it's got numbers and stuff on it. It was made by some, you know, scientist and, and all of that stuff, but it's actually it's a terrible tool for what we're trying to do, because it's not the thing that, um, that we were, you know, we're not using it for the right right purpose, right? So, so think of it that way. Uh, and then that this systematic observation and measurement offer the only route to cartographic truth. And this truth can be independently verified. And there's a lot that can be said there, but for now, all I'm going to say with this is just that idea of truth. Like truth is a word that you should just throw away. It's just, it's a, a garbage, terrible word um, because it is so subjective. The idea of objective truth, it just does not exist, right? There's no universal truth out there. You can see examples of things not being true. Um, you know, I mean, just look at uh, politics. Great example of some people think that, you know, I won't even get, I'll be really subtle with this stuff. Some people think that President A I don't know, is the greatest president ever. And then President B, who came next, is the worst president ever, right? People will believe that no matter what, and they have their facts to back that up. But then you can say, what are you talking about? President A, oh, a moron. And President B, greatest president we, we've ever had. And you're talking about the same facts, Right, pointing to the same events and policies and decisions and things like that, but you still argue about who is actually the best, and it, it doesn't work. Right? That's the issue with truth. I have my own idea of what the truth is about this and that and all these different things. You most likely have a very different idea about truth. Right? So politics and religion and that kind of stuff. That's really easy to see these issues. But when we're talking about cartography, when we're getting into these maps, just don't even think about truth, right? Throw that out of the way. Don't even really think about reality, or at least not some direct link here, right? Like map equals reality. We want to get rid of that. We want to instead say the map, it's a representation of reality. And so when I'm using this map, to do whatever it is I need to do, I need to stop and think, okay, what did the person who made this map, what did this cartographer do to represent reality? All right? How did they see reality and then take that reality and make this representation of it? And, and does it work, therefore, for what I'm trying to do? Or did they miss something? Right? Like that's that's what we're we're getting at. All right, so that's the idea here. So I sp I'm spending all this time with, with uh, old Harley and his, his idea of deconstructing the map. This is an article he wrote, you can see back in the late 80s, um, just a really good you know, wake-up call to say, hey, maps are not devoid of culture or you know, human emotion and decisions and, and, and things like that. Uh, and now looking back, it seems like, well, yeah, obviously, but it's amazing how still we tend to treat these things as perfect, almost like they were given to us from some, you know, divine being or whatever, rather than just somebody made this for whatever, you know, specific purpose. So keep that, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll constantly be, be trying to think about this as we, we move forward. All right. So thinking about a map. All right, I'm just going to get into maps in kind of generally speaking. Like, why do we have them? Why do we use them? What do they do? All right, so quite simply, when we, when we hear the word map, what we tend to think of is it just, it, you know, it shows where stuff is. And, and when I say map, too, um, should stress that, you know, I, I'm an old man. 
you can't see me uh, right now, but oh, ancient. When I hear the word map, I think of something made of paper that you would, you know, pull out of your 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 car uh, to to figure out where you're you're going or you, you look at before you drive from one place to another or hiking or, or you know things like that. That's what clicks in my mind for those of you 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 know children taking this class not as, as ancient as I, you may hear map and you, you think of something more digital, right? Something you'd pull up on your phone, right? Kind of, it doesn't matter at this point, whether we're talking paper map, digital map, the whole host of ways we can map the things. I'm just talking abstractly, right? So regardless of the medium, when we're using a map, we're typically using it because it's gonna show us where stuff is where my house is versus where I need to, to go, right? To, to get to school, to get to work, to get to that restaurant, to do whatever, okay? That's typically what we, we think of them doing here. But at the same time, it's showing where things are, but a map isn't really useful if it's just showing, you know, one location. You wanna have these spatial relationships, okay? Where multiple things are in relation to these other things. And I have the word uh, topological on here, topology. It's a, it's re rooted in uh, like mathematics and, and all that, but it's looking at, at these spatial relationships. So an example, straightforward example, uh, is something like, uh, you know, cities within states, right? So like Los Angeles, California, Los Angeles, the city, is inside of California, the state, right? That seems pretty obvious, but that's an important topological relationship. And for a map to be useful, no matter what we do to the map, no matter how we, we um, you know, initially display the stuff, or when we start getting into, you know, digital mapping and we can start to, to manipulate map features and, and change things as we're analyzing them, these topological relationships need to be maintained, right? We can never, or we, we should never produce a map that shows Los Angeles outside of California, right? That's the, that's the idea that we're getting at. But that's a key thing with this stuff is we're not just mapping where the stuff is, but what makes them useful is how we can compare multiple things, see where they exist in space. And then as we start to do that, we can, we can actually start to do some pretty cool stuff here, right? This idea of uh, just a map for navigational purposes, tell me how to get to this location, right? Yeah, that's one thing a map can do, but that's not everything. And, and frankly, that's the least interesting thing. What we can really do if we're mapping multiple things is we can start to see patterns in the landscape of where stuff is. Right? We can see similarities or we can see differences or, or things like, like that. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll, we'll see what we do with this online kind of remote teaching uh, experience. I, I assume, as I'm you know, recording this here, I'm doing so with the idea of teaching this class remotely, um, you know, in the midst of all this COVID-19 pandemic stuff. I have no idea what the future holds for uh, uh, this class and how it'll be developed and, and you know, administered. And, and also I have no idea, you know, if I'll keep any of these recordings if, if things do get back to normal, we get back to face-to-face -face classes. Uh, but I'm assuming if you're listening to this, we're doing this in, a, in at least a, a somewhat remote way. So getting into the GIS software digital mapping, things like that. It may be limited in this remote sense, mainly because I don't want to make you guys spend a lot of money on software and computers and, and things like that. But if we're actually able to be in the lab and in the class and playing around with this, we'll, we'll mess around with that stuff. We'll, we'll map things and start to see patterns and differences and what, what we can find, what a map can really do, the true power of these things. If nothing else, I'll, I'll at least give you some examples of how that stuff works. And then my my final thing in the list on this slide, of course, because I'm not, you know, conspiratorial, you know, paranoid 
guy have manipulates and confuses. Don't ever forget that, that a map can confuse the hell out of us. Whether it's that we just, we don't understand how map works, and so it's kind of confusing because there are all sorts of numbers and grid lines and things like that. Or someone made a map deliberately to overly simplify things things right or, or uh, um, you know purposefully leave out certain things so it kind of manipulates how we feel propaganda that's that's uh, something I love about maps is how easy it is to mess with people's minds with a simple map and it all goes back to the idea that we instinctively treat a map as as the truth as yes I mean look at it it's got to be true it's on a map Right, and that's what we want to always avoid, okay? And either again, for for uh, propaganda purposes, or just you know, we want to remember that this map that we're using might not be the best map for what it is we're trying to do because the person who made it, you know, made it for a specific purpose and it might not be working. All right, never forget, never forget. I know another thing, um. To think about too is that we we tend to kind of follow along with like Harley's idea of of things that are mapped through these real objective objects uh, and and also just that that they are physical objects right that they are things that we can point to in a location and say yes that is a road and that's a river and that's a you know city limit boundary and and things like that right but we have some stuff. That simply isn't physical. Now, what David Harvey would refer to as a relative space. Um, the idea of things that, uh, you know, they kind of move across locations. So networks uh, of a, a, a certain type, flows of things, where, you know, and we could say networks, we could say like, yeah, like roads, right? We can map out easily where roads are and kind of envision these networks of cars and transportation and stuff like that. But there are other things that move and that can be tricky because they we don't have like a physical road to follow behind. Like I, I have here mapping the migration routes uh, of birds. Um, and, and I always ask that. And it's always cute how, um, you know, students will say like, oh yeah, absolutely. You hook up a little GPS to them and you can track them and, and all that stuff. And technically, yeah. You can do that if you watch, you know, like Nova specials and those Animal Planet documentaries. You'll see like that one research university where they've got, you know, the funding to actually have little GPS things that they can stick on the birds and send them off flying and all that. Yeah, that's all well and good. But the reality is it's so expensive, right, to, to have that. And then you, you lose it and you don't have that. And you need good grant funding. You know, how can we do it? Like, you know, if, if we, normal people, not at a big, fancy, prestigious research university with grants and funding and all that stuff, you know, how can we do it? And, and I would usually tell the story of when I, I had to map this stuff when I worked for a, a company. And it, come, like a, 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 it was a nonprofit. Uh, it's a little group where they, they did wetland and uh, waterfowl conservation. Okay, so wetlands, meaning, you know, swamps, uh, basically waterfowl being ducks and geese and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we would map the migration, but it was all based on killing the birds uh, through hunting, right? Where we would capture birds at a certain point, like in the summer, capture these things in traps, put the little metal bands on them. Uh, that was, you know, in Northern California where we'd do that and then wait for hunting season uh, and so when a duck hunter went out, shot a bird, and the bird came down and had this little metal band, they would turn it into the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we'd record, you know, where it was banded here in California, and where over on the East Coast it was uh, it was shot and ultimately killed over that, you know, the few months in between there. It's not as nice sounding as uh, GPS, um, you know, it's a little more harmful to the bird. Uh, definitely, but uh, but that's a way, right? I just I bring this up because it's a way to map things that don't necessarily exist or leave a trace, right? Of something like the animal um, migration 
pattern stuff there. Uh, I also have one here like how do we map the the internet or can we map it, right? Like the internet is this network. I mean, right now you're you're listening to me watching this uh, this stuff here because of the internet, right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't give you a, a you know CD or DVD or whatever of uh, um, you know this recording that you then put in. You you got it from the internet. So clearly there's some kind of network in there, but how do we map that thing, right? And there are a whole bunch of different ways. I mean, you can think about it. We'll look it up. Um, I'm like going into all this stuff, but just like the way, how do we map this, this kind of more abstract stuff, the weird stuff. And we can do it. And there are a lot of um, interesting ways that people have solved these problems. Some of them more low tech than others though, right? Like when you shoot birds rather than put expensive GPS on them. Um, so that's just something to think about as we're moving forward and kind of getting out of just the straight navigation kind of field mapping stuff, but thinking about kind of bigger questions, right? What can we map and therefore what can we analyze? How can we analyze this stuff? Like that's the thing with the internet. It's not just so much can we map it, but like does that does it tell us anything based on the spatial configuration of say where people are producing content and then where is that content being uh, consumed right that might be something uh, or or maybe we're mapping you know access to to higher internet speeds versus slower internet speeds all of that all of these things however we map this stuff kind of depend on uh, or determine what we can what questions we can ask and what we can get from this stuff so that, that's the idea with that Another important component is this idea of a mental map. Right? So a mental map is simply what goes on in our brains when you know we're thinking of a place. Right? So like if I say Los Angeles to you like I did earlier, chances are you have a mental map in your mind of LA. And depending on who you are and your experience and all of that, uh, you're going to have a more detailed mental map or a less detailed mental map. Like I used to live down there. I still go down to the, the big city. Um, well, I, you know, it's COVID, so I, I don't. Um, I assume it's still there. I haven't been in a long time now. Um, but it's uh, the same thing. When when deadly viruses aren't around, I'll, you know, I'll go down. So I'm familiar with it. Have spent time in you know downtown on the west side and the east side and little different communities and all that. So I have a pretty decent mental map. I'd like to think of where things are in the um, in the city. Whereas you know for some of you, I'm just gonna assume based on experience. I know I have some students who have never been down there, um, or you know if you have, it's you know parents drove you, and you, know, you don't know where the hell you were. You just knew it was L.A. Right. Um, or maybe I say Los Angeles uh, and you you assume downtown, but then somebody else thinks Santa Monica and another person is thinking about Culver City uh, and somebody else is actually thinking about Burbank or Anaheim or what. Right. So it's we can all we can say L.A. and we all have individual ideas of what that place is. All right. That's the idea. And that's what this New Yorker um cover from the the 70s it's a new yorkers a magazine if you're not familiar a magazine is a bunch of paper that's shiny stuck together with articles inside i don't know if magazine even means anything to people anymore but okay you get the idea but this image here on here it's the idea of, of a new yorkers mental map where they're showing all the detail locally Right on Ninth Avenue, Tenth Avenue, you see the individual people and streetlights and mailboxes and windows and buildings and things like that. And then as you get farther away from someone's uh, kind of you know home turf, it gets more vague and fuzzy. You kind of you got a general idea of like yeah, Jersey's across the river, but you know there's no detail there or even any real shape or anything like that. Right? You can see that the United States is just this cube basically with some mountains and stuff here and there some cities and state names and all that stuff but it's just it's vague right and so that's something to think about but personally like this was something i realized as i started working 
with maps professionally, whether I'm making them or whether I'm uh, using them out in the field or, or whatever, I realized that I had my own biases and, and gaps in knowledge and things like that. And then if I wasn't careful, if I wasn't using, say, the map itself and I was just going off my own mental map, sometimes I could, I could be misled. I could, I could make you know, poor decisions and, and things like that. You want to be careful with it. Right. And you also, especially if you're making maps for others to use, you want to think about, okay, what am I, you know, what am I leaving out? What, what do I think of as being important to map here versus what other people, you know, might need, right? That that gets into a lot of the map making stuff that we'll, we'll talk about at some other point, right? But just, again, keep this all in mind, yeah, and this is, you know, getting into, like I was saying earlier, this idea of paper or hard copy or analog maps versus digital maps. Uh, and we'll be, actually, what you'll be doing is you'll be using, it's kind of weird, things that would be normally hard copy analog maps, but you'll be accessing them digitally and you know if you print it you'll be working with a traditional hard copy map but if you're just using it on the computer screen it'll be digital it's going to be kind of fuzzy and that's i think that's good in that it kind of shows how blurred this distinction is all right and i'll be specifically talking about you know like map data and that kind of stuff uh, as we move forward but it's important to remember that a lot of this digital stuff that we use on our phones or on computer screens or whatever today, we tend to think of it as being this wonderfully digital and therefore you know accurate, precise map that, that we've, we've got here. But a lot of that stuff is based off of these traditional hard copy maps. These things were scanned, digitized to, to make them more, more dynamic and able to, to do cool stuff with them within the computer. But it's based off of older, uh, older maps that aren't necessarily that great. I think I got a lecture on on data for you guys. I'll, I'll point out some of this stuff, but it's it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then geographic information systems that I have on here, GIS. So that's I know I've already mentioned it. I haven't really defined it, but GIS is simply it's making maps analyzing spatial data, um, map data, the stuff, meaning the, the stuff that goes into a map, right? Roads, cities, you know, disease information, like whatever you want. We take all that stuff and we're, we're manipulating it in a computer. And I say manipulate in the sense that we can add what we want, take stuff out, um, you know, compare different things. So it's really cool because we can ask questions. We can say, um, you know, what's going on with this, what's going on with that, uh, and the computer does all the hard work. That's the other great thing that I don't have to remember how to do this statistical test or what the actual math is behind it. The computer's going to do the math part. I have to remember why you would use it, right, if I want to use it for this specific thing I'm trying to do or whatever, but the, the computer does the heavy lifting. It makes life a lot easier. Okay. And and so, yeah, as I said, we're going to see a little of both, and it's going to be kind of blurry between these two things. But but remember, I, the the main thing here is always question, you know, which, which one of these do you need? Is it better to have a hard copy analog map for what I'm doing, or should I use the digital thing? Um, should I rely on what my phone is saying, or can I just take my phone to go do whatever it is I want to do, or do I need a big paper map? to use for what it is I'm going to do, all right? So we'll, we'll get back to, to all that when, when necessary here. All right, now this thing right here, this map effectiveness model, uh, this is based off of the work of Arthur Robinson, who was this incredibly important American cartographer. His whole deal um, was, was after World War II, and well, actually, during World War II, we had a lot of geographers who were helping in World War II, help, help defeat the Nazis. Um, you're welcome, by the way, if you're not a geography major, but you're listening to this. Yeah, we, we geographers, a lot of 
lot of great stories of us saving the world. Because, you know, we knew where, where stuff was and, and how to map things and, and, you know, what our troops would expect when they went into Europe or in the Pacific or, or whatever. So, yeah, a lot of stories of geographers saving the world for democracy. Um, but Arthur Robinson was a guy who, who realized that with cartography, he tried to make it more scientific, um, you know, which... We, it's got its merits. You know, some of the stuff he was into was was really great. Some of the stuff guys like Harley would, uh, uh, you know, criticize and, and all of that. But but this idea of the map effectiveness model, I think this is very useful, uh, especially for students in this class, people who are starting to learn how to really use a map more than, you know, just just the simple ways in which we use it when we see them online or you know, using our phone to go from point A to point B, right? So what, what Robinson's saying is, hey, the, a map is truly effective if we've got two things going on here. So we have this map making side and we have this map use side. And so the map making side, that's the cartographer, that's the person making the map, that person is going to follow a set of rules um, and and make a map that isn't completely oddball stuff that's that's idiosyncratic. It's all, it's based on convention, right? Consistent ways of doing things. Um, and it's important to realize too uh, that that map making that that process. There's a certain amount of lying that can go on with this stuff. Um, and not lying like to manipulate to like to confuse or whatever, but just it's you're 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 simplifying, maybe right, which is what this simplification thing is um, right here. You're you're taking something complex, like look at you know a, a map of California uh, and the coastline that we have. That's a, a jagged, irregular thing. And so maybe for the map you you know that you're doing if you're showing all of California you don't need every single little cove and and headland sticking out and and all that stuff you get the big ones like around Monterey and Santa Cruz there stuff around uh, you know L A kind of some distinct shapes that are easy to draw but all this tiny little stuff eh, you're not going to worry about it because it's not important right for what it is you're trying to do now if you're making a nautical chart. For someone to be able to take a boat, um, you know, out in the Pacific and come back uh, on land, you can't do that, right? So maybe, uh, you know, you don't want to have that level of simplification, right? That's that's the idea. These are the decisions we're making. Again, it's not reality. It's a representation of reality. Exaggeration is a case where maybe you have, like the classic examples, you've got like a road uh, and a train track, um, you know, right next to the road, right? In reality, these things are so many feet apart, right? But with your map that you're making at a certain scale, if you haven't match reality, the road and the railroad actually overlap and it's confusing and you can't see it. So you separate them more, right? Which is an exaggeration. You're exaggerating the distance. So we're like with the scale of the map, you maybe made it so that the railroad and the road are like half a mile apart, uh, when in reality, uh, they're like, you know, 200 feet apart or, or something like that, right? And this might not sound like a big deal with this, so this is some pretty basic stuff I'm getting into here, um, but it's, it's just, it's important for the map maker to realize that, okay, I've got to make certain decisions and I'm going to make these decisions based on rules that that cartographers have agreed on. I'm not going to, you know, come up with totally new stuff if it's not necessary. So that's what cartographers are going to do, right? But then it's also important for the map user, right? So the person who's going to get the map and use it for whatever it is he or she's going to use the stuff for. Um, it's important for that person to understand what the map maker did. Oh, I'm looking at the coastline, but based on this scale, there's some simplification going on. I'm not going to use this for sailing, right? Or there's some exaggeration or, oh, okay, these things have been symbolized in a specific way in here. And so it's up to me, the map user, to get a sense of what's actually, you know, going on here. And that gets into some of that critical cartography stuff. We should be questioning 
when we're using the map, you know, what, what happened? What went into the production of this map, right? And so that means, even if you don't want to go on and be a cartographer, don't want to, you know, be a hardcore geographer uh, with your career, but if you're going to use maps, you still need to have a general idea of what went into making these maps, whether they're digital or analog, right? And so as that map user, that means that's what we mean by reading and interpretation and analysis down here. It's you know how this map was made, and therefore you know what the map can do and what it can't do, and you can derive information from the data presented on the map and do so in a, you know, in an intelligent manner, right? And at the same time, that map maker should keep that map user in mind. And so if you're making a map, you're thinking, okay, who am I making this map for? If I make a map, which I've, I've you know, I've made maps for like books, um, you know, like history books and, and academic books and, and things like that, where it's simply, it's a reference, um, right? It's so somebody reading the book, the history of, of whatever place, they can uh, look at the map and they just get a sense of, okay, that's where the country is in relation to this other country, this is where the city um, that they're talking about in chapter two is located, that kind of stuff, right? If I'm making that kind of map, I'm making different decisions than if, say, I'm making a map, uh, which I've also done for, you know, for researchers to go out into the field and use, right? Because they have different skills than the average just history book reader. We kind of assume they have more specialized field work skills. So I'm gonna include more information, maybe, or I'm gonna work harder to make sure that, uh, um, you know, the accuracy is as good as it possibly can be because these people in the field are gonna be using it for navigation and for location and analysis and stuff like that. Whereas if I'm drawing a map of Europe to put into a book, I think it doesn't really matter how accurate it is in terms of, you know, scale and, and you know, borders and, and things like that. As long as it works, nobody's going to take some book. Um, like if you're going to, you know, I don't know, backpack across Europe, right? And you and you thought, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to start in Portugal and I'm going to go all the way over to, I don't know, Ukraine or, or whatever, um, you know, and so, and I'm just going to be, it's me, me and my backpack and I'm gonna be hiking and doing all that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go buy a weird history book. Uh, and use that one map in the front of the book to, to get from one side to the other, right? Nobody's going to do that. So I don't have to be as, as careful with all that because I know it's not being used for navigation. That's the point. And so this whole map effectiveness thing, the idea is we've got uh, um, two sides working together, right? A map is going to be truly useful if both the map maker and the map user are working together to uh, know this stuff. And so the, the main point of this class, while I'll dabble in some of the cartography stuff, the main thing I want you guys to take from this is that you will be competent map users. So in whatever it is you have to do in the future, whether it's simply, you know, you're on, you're on Twitter or Instagram or, or whatever it might be, and a map pops up showing something, you can look at it and you can go, yeah, that makes sense. Or, oh no, actually this is, this doesn't work. This is confusing the, the thing. And you know, you can critically analyze it, right? That's just kind of generally speaking, every human should be able to do that at this point in time. So I want you to be able to do that. But then also, if you are one of the students who is, is taking this class because you have plans of working with maps in the field in some way or back in the office for you know analysis purposes or whatever you want to do some kind of spatial research of some kind or you need to do some kind of navigation out in the real world of some kind that's beyond your phone just you know telling you where to go i want you to be competent from that map use perspective right that you can properly read a map you can analyze what's going on you can interpret what that cartographer did, what reality is doing, what's going on in reality, right? And then figure out what you need to do to do whatever it is you need to do. So that's that's the goal. And that's why this map effectiveness thing is so crucial here. All right, another 
map component that's worth uh, talking about, just introducing right now, is this idea of orientation. Okay, and so when we say to orient a map, uh, we're, we're basically saying figuring out where north is, right? That's the, the goal. So I use this uh, map as an example and just will ask students in the classroom, okay, where's north um, on this map? And, and a handful of students will say at the top, like immediately before I can even ask where's north, they just say to the top because, uh, you know, so north is always at the top, right? No. Um, so first off, don't ever assume that. Right, there should be some indication of where north is. The convention is to draw it at the top of the page, but it doesn't always work out. Right, with this one, it's not at the top. And if you haven't, like, if you want to play along at home, you can pause this uh, and look for it if you haven't found it yet. As I've been rambling here, but I'll show you now where it's at. It's it's in the upper right of the map. Let's see if I can get my cursor here. So this is our north arrow, meaning that north is over here, and therefore east would be at the top of the map, right? South would be to the right, and at the bottom that would be west. Now why is it this uh, this way? Chances are, this is from an assessor's map book, um, so it's chances are this this particular map that they have right here, it just fit better on the page this way to go into that book, to go into the binder. It would be used for taxation and, and stuff like that, right? Um, so don't assume that north is always going to be at the top of the, uh, uh, the map. Uh, and also, you know, be aware, too, that it's, it's an arbitrary thing. It's, it's because of some dead Greek guide that we even think of North being at the top. It's, it's because of uh, people in the Middle Ages in Europe that we even use the word orientation. Like a lot of this stuff, and this gets into Harley's whole thing about, about maps not being real, right? It's not objective reality. This is stuff that humans, either currently, recently, or thousands of years ago, decided to do, right? They made some kind of decision. And as we're working with this stuff too, we'll see, you know, it's it's good to know these cardinal directions, um, but, but, you know, it'll be kind of up to you. Do you want to have north at the top of the page, no matter where you're, you know, positioned in the field, or do you want to move the page itself to where north is and to how you're standing and, and all that? Like, you'll learn as you start to work with this stuff, what actually is important? What's the best thing for you to, to do in terms of orientation and some of these other things? We're actually using the map, but always look for north. And one thing too, we'll, we'll learn um, in a few weeks when we start talking about map projections and taking a the round um, globe and making it flat. Uh, it's the idea that uh, on some maps, north isn't consistent throughout the whole thing. So in some cases, like in the middle of the page, it may be north's at the top. Uh, but as you move over, you still north isn't still pointed in that direction. It gets kind of funky, and we'll, we'll get into that. All right, another concept to just bring up right now is this idea of planimetric maps versus topographic maps. Uh, and so planimetric here is simply talking about we're looking from above, right? So this this view here, we'll, we'll refer to it as orthographic, meaning we're looking down at the earth and our eyes are meeting the ground at a 90 degree angle, right? So it's like we're flying above the city, in this case, uh, Cusco uh, in Peru, down in South America. So this, this map is, it's like we're flying over um, Cusco, we're staring down at it, and so our eyes are hitting the ground at that perpendicular or 90 degree angle. And so that's like that's what Google Maps is for the most part when you just have it in this basic view here, right there. And that's great um, to just get a sense of where stuff is, right? But one issue is it really doesn't do a good job of showing reality. Okay, so we're looking at it here in this planimetric sense. Uh, here's a photo from the same area. 
And so what you can see if you look up this uh, uh, narrow little ancient road right here, it just goes straight up, right? And this is going up into one of the, the outer slums of the city. And the hills are just built up on this incredibly steep slope um, out there. And so you can see, you know, this doesn't really do justice to what this city looks like, to the terrain, right? The hilly terrain and all of that. So Google Maps can be great to get a sense of, I've never heard of the city, where is it in relation to me or whatever, right? Or it can, it can be good if I need to drive from one place to another. And look, if there's a hill, I don't care. My, you know, my car can go up the hill. It's it, no big deal. No effort from, uh, from me. So it doesn't matter, right? But if I need to, you know, walk from one place to another, get a sense of, uh, you know, what it's going to take for me to move my own body to get from point A to point B, that planetmetric map might not be very useful, um, which is where topographic maps come into play. And so a topographic map, the, it doesn't just mean elevation, okay? So relief refers to elevational difference on a map. So if I have a relief map, the idea is that it's focused on elevation specifically, okay? Whereas topographic is really trying to show everything out there in the landscape, right? Not just the, the elevations, but, but the idea of, you know, the mountains themselves and the valleys and the water that flows through there and the vegetation and, and things like that. So it's trying to give you this complete perspective. And we still have it in this 2D form, like we had with that planimetric map, but the key thing here are these contour lines. So the brown lines in here, wherever these lines are, that's an area, wherever it touches, that's an area of a specific elevation. So we see with this index contour right there, that 3,000, that means it's 3,000 feet above sea level, all right? And sometimes it's in meters too. You always want to check that stuff. But this one would be in in uh, feet right here. Uh, so anywhere this line touches is 3,000 feet above sea level. And then there's a specific interval as you move around here. Um, so every other contour line you have, like this one and this one, it's every, I don't know, whatever, 40 feet, 100 feet, 20 feet, 5 feet, something like that. Sometimes it's also a meter. So again, you want to check what the units are. But it's just, it's trying to give you a sense of mountains, valleys, steep slopes, gradual things, stuff like that. And so we'll work on being able to read this stuff. This is something the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, produced to kind of help illustrate how to read these things, how they work. Um, and so you can see this is what it would look like in reality. If we're standing across the, you know, the water here, we're flying in a plane or something and we're looking out at it, we tend to call it the bird's eye view. Um, this is what the terrain would look like, right? And that same terrain is what they're mapping right here. So like these contour lines that are closer together, that represents this steep cliff right there, right? And then where the slope is more gradual out here, these contour lines are spread apart. That's how we read it. As I said, we'll spend time with this stuff. These maps are incredibly useful if you have to work outside in a non-developed area, outside of an urban area, right? So we'll learn how to read these, how to actually interpret what's going on with these things, as well as how to use them to, you know, record uh, data out in the field and then plot it on here and and so on and, and all that stuff. All right, so that's that's the idea with that. Okay, bathymetry or bathymetric map, it's the same kind of idea as topographic maps, except it's looking at depth within a body of water. So we're not going to worry about these, mainly because we don't have a lot of good examples of these things like in the the lab um on campus and and you know it's not a boating class sorry um if you want to really know how to like read this stuff and and you know nautical charts and stuff like that join the navy um or i or i guess you know take a class that focuses on it but we're going to be looking at more you know land-based navigation stuff um so we won't get into it but this is just another way to you know, have a 2D map, but show what's happening 
you know, within an area in three dimensions. Okay, thematic mapping, we'll see what we do in this class. I'm not entirely sure what we'll be able to, to pull off uh, in here, but a thematic map is a way to, uh, to map patterns, right, out there in space. So in this, this actually goes back to when we're catching ducks and stuff like that, a uh, map I put together to show specific traps and what, you know, species were caught, how many things were caught and, and all of that uh, in this area. Um, and so it's showing, you know, the, the symbols themselves, the bigger the symbol, the more the birds. And then you have the pie chart thing to show the different species in there. So it's not, it's not for navigation. It's not to show you how to get to one place to another or anything like that. No, is what it is, is to show you patterns in the landscape, right? And this can be quite powerful. It's really great. And I'm going to have you guys mess with like Excel charts and learn how to, to input data into these things. But nobody ever wants to read an Excel chart if you don't have to. One of these spreadsheets, it's just, oh, it just all blurs together. But if you can take that same spreadsheet information, or your data rather, and turn it into map information, some kind of visual display, oh, it's fantastic, right? And that's a key thing. If you get into research, map making, anything, field-based stuff, any of this stuff, if you're ever in the position of taking your findings, what you found out in the field or what somebody else found in the field, and then turning it into a map, it's, it's a great way to move ahead in whatever company or organization or agency or whatever you're, you're working for. Like this kind of stuff, really not that hard to do, but I've had so many bosses um, that I've worked for in the, the past where, you know, just being able to turn a spreadsheet into some pretty map, um, you know, have, have some sexy display of information for, for some boss, they're, they're amazed, they're blown away, and they will gladly, you know, keep you around. Um, you, you're kind of the last to be fired, if, you know, or laid off or whatever, if you can do this kind of stuff, right? Not saying it's, it's a great way to, to think about working, but you should have kind of that mercenary uh, attitude of like, look, how can I make sure that this place I'm working for wants to keep me around? Right, that I'm I'm the best employee and therefore the last one to get laid off in a recession or in some kind of corporate merger or whatever it might be. Right, so just uh, think about that. There's there are all sorts of practical reasons to do this that don't have anything to do with the actual science or or work that you're trying to do. Right, we'll talk about that more later. Okay, another thing just fun to look at. We're not going to play with these. Um, in here, but a cartogram is a way to uh, take spatial data. So in this case, it's election data that we're looking at. So based on counties around the United States from one of the last presidential elections uh, that we we had, um, you know, blue being going for the Democrat, red going for the Republican, um, it, it can be misleading if we just map it like this. One on the left here is what the United States looks like. Uh, of course, we ignore, you know, Hawaii and, and Alaska because that's typically harder to map um, and, and fit in here. Um, but, you know, you get the idea. Uh, but if you look at this, you see a whole lot of red. And it always makes it look like, you know, in, in recent elections anyway, that the Republican just won the vast majority of the votes in the country. Just a sea of red and little tiny bips, blips of blue. But when we make a cartogram, where we take the data here, but we change the shape based on, in this case, population, right? So again, this is counties that we're talking about uh, in here. Um, we look at how many people are actually there, how many votes are actually there. So in California, like the, the blue shapes here get way bigger because of the millions of people that are actually crammed into these counties. Whereas out here, in some of these red states, you still have some blue in there. That's typically from the cities in states, you know, like Idaho and Wyoming and, and, you know, Montana, these places out here. You'll see maybe, you know, the city goes for the Democrat. The rest of it goes for um, 
the Republican, but because these states just don't have that many people, period, they shrink down. They're drawn smaller, right? So it's to give a better idea of the blue versus the red in this case. And it can be kind of weird to look at, but again, we're not using it for navigation. I don't need to use this to know how to get, you know, from California to Utah or something like that. I just want to get a sense of the red compared to the blue. A cartogram can be incredibly useful. So those are, are fun to, to see. And there's some stuff online where you can mess around and try to make your own, but it's, it's beyond the scope of what we're going to be doing in here. But that's what a cartogram is. So again, it's a way to map some existing um, data, but manipulate the space itself or the place itself. You manipulate the spatial boundaries to really highlight what's going on with the data that we're mapping. All right, that's the general idea behind it. Okay, remote sensing, we're kind of wrapping up. I'm just trying to get through all this um, intro stuff. Um, with remote sensing, we'll see a little bit of this stuff. We're not gonna use it too much, um, but it's the idea of, you know, a whole host of things that we we can use. LiDAR, it's, kind of, it's the coolest thing that we've got where it's it's like you know sonar or radar or things like that but in this case we're sending beams of light down to a surface and they're bouncing back up and the computer's recording how long it takes for the light to go away and to come back right and we use lidar um we'll put it in a plane uh you know typically that's what what uh, like commercial companies will do they'll have some kind of lidar device in an airplane they'll fly over an area and what they're recording, it's it's the the land, right? The the underlying land. And they what they can produce, like what we see here on this slide, it's called a DEM or digital elevation model. Okay, and so a DEM is a great tool for when you start to actually make maps. And this one, you know, this kind of looks weird. It, it, they always look like weird tree x-ray things but what it's showing you the the lighter the color the higher the elevation and the darker the color the lower the elevation and so we can use this for just some you know computer based analysis and stuff like that but what's also really cool is we can produce what's called shaded relief which is where we we take the data here we can we can uh, model the idea of the sun coming up from a certain angle at a, a certain angle in the sky certain direction you know, uh, um, from where we're, we're at here. And we can model the, the light and the shadows. We can make it actually look like, you know, mountains and, and valleys and all that stuff. It's incredibly accurate. So it's great for flood modeling, stuff like that, right? We've, uh, a lot of this is used um, by governments to uh, look at like, okay, we've got this dam and this reservoir up at the top of this mountain. If something goes wrong with the dam, um, you know, what's going to happen? How, like this was a big thing after 9-11. Everyone was convinced that we were going to have terrorists coming around to all of our dams and blowing this stuff up. And we wanted to know, okay, who's going to die if that takes place? And they never released this stuff to the general public, um, or at least not for a while, because they were worried everybody's going to panic. I got to see some of it. It's because they were learning like GIS and, and, um, and, you know, as part of the club, um, right after 9-11 and everybody was freaking out about this. So I saw some of these and they make animations and it was just terrifying. It was basically, if you live anywhere near a dam and downhill from it, you're, you're dead. Um, you know, quickly, all this water is going to come down. So, yeah, kind of it's useful. You get a sense of what's going on. It can also be depressing when you realize just how how scary life is uh, around you for, for that kind of stuff. Um, so that's uh, that's one example of remote sensing. I'll see if we talk about it more, what we can do in this remote context here. Uh, but here's like the, the idea of shaded relief. So that's a similar, not the same uh, DEM, but this would be the result of, of uh, taking that original LiDAR data and producing shaded relief. And this one has kind of this scraped earth thing going on, which is kind of weird, but you can see this blob thing here and these weird bumps and dots. What some of these companies will do when they fly 
the LiDAR stuff for you, they'll produce a, a shaded relief thing where they try to strip out the roads and buildings and things like that to just give you kind of a, just like the bare earth, right? And it doesn't, you know, this, and this was from a while ago. I think this one was produced like 15 years ago, something like that. Maybe they've done better um, with, with getting rid of buildings. Um, so it all kind of looks funky and you can still definitely see road networks and things like that out there. But that's, so if you see any of the stuff and you see that, that's what it is. It's going into the, you know, with the computer, trying to get rid of the human touch and just get a general sense of what the earth looks like in this particular area. And the, the idea is to help with things like flood modeling and, and all that, I, I suppose, although it seems like you'd want to keep your buildings and stuff there, but what do I know? All right, and then another thing we can do, this is an example of taking this started out as LIDAR uh, data that we had, a DEM, doing the shaded relief, then taking another type of remote sensing like aerial photography, overlaying that, kind of merging these two things together, putting in uh, lines for the actual roads and text and, and stuff like that, and just playing around with, um, you know, just making a, a cool looking map. Right. And that's so that's a cool thing with, with remote sensing is if you can if you have access to it. And that's one issue is like getting good LIDAR data. It can be pretty expensive. Um, so if you're not working for a government agency, you might not have access to the good stuff. But if, if you can get it and you learn how to, to mess around with it, you can just make some sexy looking stuff. It doesn't necessarily make this map any better than just a standard, you know, road map of the area or whatever. But it sure does look good, right? I mean, that's the that's the idea of why you would want to mess around with this stuff apart from doing analysis, right, of the terrain. Just, it's just to make good-looking maps. Oh, and you, and you can do 3D stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you get it. Um, this is the 3D stuff. We're not going to mess with this. Was it was the 3D was really cool, like 20 years ago when I started messing with this stuff. Now it's kind of you know we've seen the 3D or we're not going to worry about that in here. Anyway, it's beyond what we're doing, but, you know, there you go. All right, so I'm going to end here because I've rambled long enough on this stuff. I'm going to break this lecture into multiple components, but that at least, what we just went over, was a general introduction to the kinds of things we're going to be thinking about, but at least from a theoretical standpoint. And as I said, we're going to be playing with the actual maps and with compasses and with GPS and, and all that stuff. It's not going to be this incredibly dull theoretical or abstract class, but a lot of this stuff is important to think about as you move forward. And I say that as having someone who took, uh, as being someone who took classes from people who some of the folks spent time on theory. And even if it scared me when I originally did it, it ultimately, it made sense. Eventually it, it helped me out. And then I had other classes where there was no theory whatsoever. And while those were fun and they were easy, they didn't really help me become a good, competent either map user, right, or map maker. So that's why I'm taking the time to go over this. It's, look, it's your vegetables, kids, right? Eat them. They may taste like garbage, but they're going to help you grow big and strong as little uh, geographers. And that's the idea. All right, there you go, folks. I'll uh, I'll talk to you later.